All right, <laughs> just a little bit past two, so welcome everybody. My name is Josh Buck, and I am the new executive director curator here at the Clark Historical Museum. Before we get started today, I would like to make a land acknowledgement that we are on historically we ought land, and I invite you to take a look at the greater collection here at the Clark Museum. Even if you've been here before, we have rotating exhibits that are frequently on display. Within this room, it is the largest collection of Native American basketry belonging to the many tribes here in the Pacific Northwest, including the Hoopa, the Weot, the Karuk, and the Yurok, in addition to many more. So after this presentation, feel free to wander about and see what this collection has to offer. In addition, I would like to take the time to give a heartfelt thank you to all of those who I've interviewed over the years. Each one of these wonderful individuals has recounted part of their lives and has shared in detail with me the history of our area. I will be sharing many of their stories in due time as future presentations roll out. I'd also like to thank all of those who have joined me on my many adventures to document all of the infrastructure that you will be seeing in this presentation. My generation likes to say that we were born too late to explore the Earth and too soon to explore the stars. And I would like to think that those of you who have joined me would discard that notion. I'd also like to thank a number of institutions here locally including local schools that without their support and guidance, the knowledge that they've given me, I would not be who I am today without them. And of course, an utmost heartfelt thank you to my wonderful wife, Maya Blumenthal, who without her support, absolutely none of this would have been possible. She is one of the few people that I know that has been to darn near as many of the historic sites that you'll see today as I have and her dedication to preserving local history is unparalleled. Josh, can you turn your overhead lights on? Sure. Uh, let's see. Could we hit the overhead lights? Or to tur turn the overhead lights off? That better? All right. Thank you. It's just for recording purposes, it doesn't amplify. I'll, I'll speak up. A little bit about myself. Once upon a time, I was born in 1995 in Arcata. I was then raised in McKinleyville by my two wonderful parents, Jason and Terry Buck. I couldn't tell you for certainty, with certainty, whether or not I actually got to ride a local excursion train as our local railroad shut down in the El Nino storm event of 1998. Could you speak louder, please? Yes. But I can tell you one thing. I certainly grew up walking the Northwestern Pacific Railroad. My first true introduction to it was in the summer of 2006 on a family vacation to a little area deep in the Eel River Canyon called Eel Rock. How many of you have been to Myers Flat before along 101? So Eel Rock is a little bit more inland than Myers Flat, but I highly recommend that you go out and check it out. It is a place that is absolutely stunning and beautiful, but it also has a significant history, especially in respect to our local railroad. When on that summer vacation, we decided to make a hike up to what I would later find out to be is Tunnel 34. Tunnel 34 of 40 tunnels, 30 of which are between Willits and Eureka. When I first visited this tunnel, I was hooked instantly. I wanted to learn more, and I wanted to see more of this infrastructure that has kind of fallen by the wayside. Back then, in 2006, it had only been about eight years since, I, since the railroad had closed, and back then it was still a relatively pleasant hike not too overgrown, free of poison oak. 
Since then, you can see in this return trip 10 years later that the same trees that are on that photo on the left have grown up significantly. I also invite you to make use of the map that I've got. I'm sure for many of you that these local place names that I'll throw out are familiar, but just in case, this map does detail where all of these tunnels are in relation to the place names that I'll be talking about. The other place that we visited on that family vacation was a spot a little bit further south called Fort Seward, which is about 60 miles south of Eureka here. As we wandered the halls of this place, little did I realize that I was seeing the inside of what was soon to be a hundred-year-old structure, long since abandoned. But again, this was the kind of thing that made me want to learn more about history, especially local. Once I grew up, I ended up going to Humboldt State University as a history major. I ended up going to Humboldt State as a history major, and that time spent there gave me the opportunity to research in detail, not just in the classroom, but getting out into the field as well to see what this county has to offer. Before we get into the rail end of things, I'd like to give you a bit of background on why rail technology in Humboldt County became so important. Dialing the clock back to the 1850s, the only way that you could realistically get to Humboldt with ease was through the mouth of Humboldt Bay. Now, Humboldt Bay, as many of you know, is extremely treacherous for a variety of reasons. For one, on, a given, on any given day, it's extremely foggy. For a second, you can see here that there is the North Jetty and the South Jetty, which helped make these waters more navigable. But for these early ships that were coming in, neither of those existed. So between two tidal changes every 24 hours and all of the other obstacles that were in the way, we had a significant amount of accidents that occurred over the years. Just between the years of 18, let's see, 1853 and 1907, 39 lives were lost just trying to get into Humboldt Bay. Note that this doesn't include all of the greater maritime accidents that occurred in the surrounding area of Humboldt Bay. This is just trying to get over Humboldt Bar within a particular window of time. And I've developed a bit of a chronology for you as to some of the more notable accidents where several people or individuals lost their lives just trying to get here. Even when you made it into the bay, there were further obstacles. As you move closer into our, what's now Arcata, formerly Union, you would have had to make use of the sloughs. Why? Because as you get closer to what's now Arcata Marsh, the area turns into tidal mudflats, which prevented ships from landing with ease. As a result of this, these ships made use of what was formerly known as Big Slough. Today, it's known as Gannon Slough, and looking at this picture, you might be thinking, how was it that a ship was able to go up this and make port? Well, that slough has changed significantly over the course of time. But if you go out to it today, you'll see that there's not only a rail bridge and Highway 101, but a pedestrian bridge as well. Where exactly is so this is, for perspective, this is between Eureka and Arcata. Yeah. If you were at the Arcata Marsh and followed the tracks for about a mile or, not, not even a mile or two uh, south of there, you would wind up here so at Gannon So this is the bike path? It is, exactly. If you frequent the walking path that is along Highway 101, you would find that this is part of it that you would be walking over. It's a good question. Because ships had to navigate these small sloughs, Union was never a sure thing. If it, if it was going to retain itself as an actual place name that would not become one of the many 
future ghost towns that exist within Humboldt, it needed to find a way to bring in bigger ships. Why? You needed economic surplus. You needed to be able to bring in people. You needed to be able to bring in goods and services to the area. That's why in 1854, it was decided that they would build a huge wharf, a 14,000 foot wharf, just under two miles, that jetted out into what is now Arcata Bay. If you go out to the marsh today, you can actually see the remains of this huge wharf that used to exist. And I've got a couple of pictures of it for you. This wharf was spearheaded by the Union Wharf and Plank Walk Company, first integrated in 1854. Not only did the wharf exist, but in order to make it easier to transport goods from one end to the other, they decided to build what is arguably California's oldest railroad. Now, this was not a railroad in the conventional sense. It did not have steel rails and it did not have a steam locomotive, at least for a few years. Instead, it was wooden rails and then horse-drawn carts. How many of you have seen this mural in Arcata before? It's kind of obstructed now, but it is on an apartment building that's very close to where you would exit if you wanted to go to, say, Jacoby Creek. On this mural, it gives you an idea of what this wharf used to look like. Ships were now able to make port here much easier. And with the accessibility, larger ships could come in. On the very left of this image, you can see what this railroad used to look like in the very beginning. This white horse here, yes. Where is that located? This mural. It, it is located in Arcata, very close to the Arcata Marsh. Yes, it's, it's on the side of an apartment building. It's now obstructed by a new one. The horse that you see here in this photo was nicknamed Spanking Fury. Now, there were many horses that were used as motive power for hauling supplies to and from this wharf. But Spanking Fury stood the test of time. Now, there are a number of opinions out there as to the accuracy of this history when it comes to this particular horse but it did have a temper. And just like steam locomotives, both of them have personality, and the worse that you treat them, the more likely they are to cause you trouble. What was the draw of bringing people here? Redwood timber. Redwood timber. Yes. It was the logging industry. Exactly. San Francisco at the time was a quote-unquote teenager of a city, and it was looking to expand. They knew that Humboldt County was home to vast resources, particularly the huge stands of old growth redwood timber. One massive old growth log had enough wood in it to create a two story structure. So there was a lot of economic incentive to make use of Humboldt County and all of the timber stands. Well, there, there are still plenty of pictures out there of these massive old growth trees. Um, it was estimated that the old growth would last about 200 years at the rate of logging that they were expecting. And today we have about 5 to 7% of that old growth left. If you go down to, say, Avenue of the Giants, you'll see quite a bit of it. For perspective on just how big of a project this was, this is a photo taken some time later. This is well after use of this wharf was discontinued. But you can see just how far this wharf jetted out into the bay and made it possible for these ships to land. And this is Arcata in the backdrop. This is another photo that would give you an idea. So the wharf is all the way up there in the upper corner. And the railroad that they built jetted into town about two miles. So at the time, it was a very short railroad, but boy, it was doing a whole lot of work. Eventually, the real horse was replaced by that of the iron horse. 
you take a look here, you will see a picture of what later became known as Arcata and Mad River Number no. 1, the first steam locomotive in Humboldt County. It served the area for many years. And as the desire to reach further away timber stands increased, the mileage of this railroad did as well. In 1876, it was decided to extend the railroad all the way to what's now known as Jolly Giant Mill. The mill was located very close to where Humboldt State University is today. And you'll see a photo of that area here in a second. After that first extension, it was pretty well established that this was a technology that could be used to ensure the economic longevity of the county. And they decided to extend it again, this time to Warren Creek, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you take a look at the lower right here, you'll see a picture of a fellow named Mr. Zaruba. Now, Mr. Zaruba was a, uh, was a relative of the Corbell brothers, if you're familiar with Corbell near Blue Lake. But this is him on an inspection vehicle that was located on the wharf that you saw a few minutes ago. Eventually, this railroad would reach all the way from Arcata to Corbell. It's not a particularly long railroad, but what it did do was move so much tonnage when it came to the redwood industry from point A to point B to awaiting ships that would tend then take that lumber and ship it out of the area. Did it ship it just within the country or around the world? Or Eventually around the world. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, post-war Europe, especially pr after World War I, World War II, we're making use of the timber stands here locally. This is a colorized photograph of the Jolly Giant Mill that's very close to where Humboldt State is, or Cal Poly Humboldt is now. The first locomotive that was actually built in-house here in the county was known as the Black Diamond. As far as I'm aware, there is only one picture of this locomotive, and this is it. You can see it. That little dot right there. So unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot more as far as sources on that. The photo was taken in approximately 1878. As I mentioned, the railroad was extended from Arcata to Warren Creek first before reaching Corbell. This is a before and after, so to speak, of the evolution of that area. The first photo being taken in 1903 the second being taken in 1979. And as you can see, this trestle still actually stands. It is not the same trestle that is in that top photo, but it is very similar. And you can see that this very old technology, this old infrastructure, was used for the entire lifetime of this railroad. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Here's a map to give you some perspective on how far this railroad jetted out, right from Arcata Bay to Corbell. The reason that I bring up this particular railroad is A, it's the first in our area. B, it indicated that this was the technology that was going to ensure that the redwood industry would grow and the communities that would spring up with it. This is just a partial list of the railroads that would then boom and explode within the county. The second railroad that I'd like to talk to you about is the Eel River and Eureka Railroad. Now there are many predecessor railroads prior to the, the establishment of the Northwestern Pacific Railroad in 1907 that would eventually become integrated into its right-of-way. But the first one is the Eel River and Eureka Railroad, or at least the first one I like to cover. I like to talk about this one because it is the first railroad in our area to make use of a tunnel. That tunnel actually still exists. I'm sure all of you at some point recently have driven over Table Bluff. 
locomotives do not have the luxury of going up particularly steep grades. If you've driven up uh, Table Bluff Hill, you know how steep it is, even for cars. The engineers of this railroad knew that the only way they were going to be able to reach the timber stands on the south side of Table Bluff was to actually build a tunnel right through that bluff. Is that tunnel still accessible? It is. And you'll so see... It, it, exactly. So if you go to Lolita today and walk the tracks for about a mile and a half north, you'll reach this tunnel. Now, it used to be a pretty darn pleasant hike. These days, there's a whole lot in your way. It is still one of the more accessible tunnels in our area. But with more time and with less and less interest in going to it, it will be retaken by nature pretty quickly. When they were building this particular tunnel, a gentleman by the name of Blackburn, who was the lead contractor on this project, was blasting on the south end. They were using dynamite to blow apart Table Bluff and build right through it. Blackburn was, right, uh, was excavating, and the actual roof liner of the tunnel ended up caving in right on top of him. Now, he was buried up to about right here, couldn't move, and it was reported that several of the employees tried to dig him out. But even with that much dirt in front of him, it was going to be a minute before they could get him out. Now, he was complaining and complaining, saying that there was a piece of wood that was also jammed under underneath him. All of a sudden, an even bigger collapse occurred and buried him entirely. Unfortunately for Mr. Blackburn, he did succumb to the injuries. He literally suffocated to death trying to build this local piece of infrastructure. One of the questions that I've gotten in the past is just how many people died building this route. He was the first in what would become the NWP. This is a photograph taken of the south end, or the, I'm sorry, the north end of this tunnel. And you can see I would not recommend walking from uh, north of Table Bluff because it is so inundated with brush and debris now. The second paramount local railroad that I like to tell you about is the Pacific Lumber Company's railroad. Now, I'm sure several of, you, several of you have been to Scotia, probably recently. Scotia used to be called Forestville. The Pacific Lumber Company wanted to build a mill there within what is now Scotia, and they wanted to have a railroad that would be able to reach from Scotia to Humboldt Bay. Now that's a pretty tall order. Not in terms of tunneling, but in terms of building bridges and the mileage. Now, if you are driving down 101, you'll notice that when you cross from what's now Rio Dell to Scotia, that there is a highway bridge that spans over the Eel River. There is no railroad trestle there, though, and there's a very good reason for that. The founder of Rio Dell, a man by the name of Lorenzo Painter, was approached by the Pacific Lumber Company. Now, Painter owned all the land within Rio Dell, so the company had to make him a proposition. They had to tell him, hey, here is our offer. We'd like to make use of your property, build a railroad through it. It'll be great for both of us. Now, there are conflicting reports about this, but Painter reportedly took their offer and then asked them to double it. The Pacific Lumber Company said, I think that we're okay. We're going to make use of an alternative route, one that would take them along what's called the Scotia Bluffs. You can see the blue line here represents what they were originally hoping to do whereas the red line represents what they actually ended up having to go with. Building along this area on the right proved to be a mistake that would plague our local railroad until its closure. This bluff is made out of sandstone. If you go to it today, you will find fossils embedded in it. It's part of an ancient seabed, 
And whenever you get about 10 inches of rain in the rain gauge, you are going to see slides like crazy. But the Pacific Lumber Company still needed a route, and this was what they had to choose. Can I interject something? Sure. Um, the story I heard was you did it twice. Yes, and we are getting to that. Oh, you'll it. It's all good. The Pacific Lumber Company built their route but within a year, they had figured out that the earth was moving so much, as you can see in these photos, wiping out their track and their right-of-way, that they wanted to reapproach Painter. This is a particularly interesting quote from 1886, about one year after the railroad was completed. It says, there is an ugly-looking bluff across the river from Rio Dell, and every winter, more or less, sliding occurs. Since the rains of last week began, Another slide is amassed there, and a hydraulic pump was put in. It is predicted that the Pacific Lumber Company will have considerable trouble in the future with the locality. Boy, if that wasn't the best assessment that I've read for local railroad history. As you can see, Matt Johnson, who went out to an area very close to where the picture on the left was taken, this was the result of that recent earthquake that we had. The tracks are buried right underneath there. This shows the volatility of this geology. It moves constantly, whether it's rain, seismic activity, all issues. This is a photograph to give you an idea of what the composition of the bluffs are made out of. You can see the fossilized seashells embedded in this. Now, Painter was approached again because they knew, why don't we just build a bridge over the Eel River? We could avoid building along this bluff if we could just build a bridge right here. And so they gave in to Painter's asking price. They reapproached him and said, you know what, we'll take you up on that offer that you gave previously. And he said, that's funny, I'm doubling it again. Now, the Pacific Lumber Company despite having tucked their tail between their legs and reapproaching him again, said, well, forget that. We're just going to keep this because economically, if we're going to justify spending that much money, then we're just going to keep the route that we've got. Now, later on in life, Painter fell on hard economic times. He was about 75 years old, and he was battling an ongoing court case here in Eureka. Because of that economic hardship, he got very depressed. It got to the point where he was going around town in Rio Dell and he was telling all the citizens, today is the day I'm finally gonna take my life. Now he did this so frequently that the people in Rio Dell did not actually end up believing him until one day he actually went through with it. There's a few different stories that go with this. One I've heard is that he actually climbed up to Nanning Creek Trestle and jumped. The other one is, is that he went to the river's edge with all of his uh, very personal belongings, weighted himself down, and jumped into the river and drowned himself. Either way, he, he drowned in the Eel River. I've got a third take on yes, I'd love to hear it. That is much more in detail than what I, I, I appreciate you I sharing that. The that would be great. To reiterate what the gentleman here just said, it sounds like Painter went up to the river's edge, he dressed like Abraham Lincoln, removed his top hat, placed it on the river's edge, and then waded into the river and drowned himself. So there's actually three stories now as to how this guy committed suicide. Sorry, can you summarize the Sure. <laughs> the, 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 the first story that I heard 
was that he went up to an area called Nanning Creek, which is along the Scotia Bluffs. And there's a trussle there, and he reportedly jumped into the river from that trussle. So there's two suicide stories. There, there are three, apparently. Okay. And um, the middle one then? And the middle one was that it's very similar to the third one, but he filled his pockets oh, right. with as much as he could weigh himself down with and then waded into the river. Any, any way you look at it, he was not a happy man. Exactly. <laughs> and it was actually reported in the newspaper that he would rather pass into the spirit world than live to see his property take away from him and that he was of right of mind at the time. So after all this time of him saying, well, today's the day I'm going to do it, he actually did end up going through with it. Josh, the other story is after, um, after his uh, death and everyone was, was still down on him for, uh, for being such a hard ass about uh, bargaining that all he asked for was um, for a station to be established. That is absolutely and, true. Um, NWP was willing, or the member was willing to even grant him that. Yes. That is the other end of this story, which is that Painter didn't have an actual very high asking price. What he asked for was an actual station within Rio Dell, but the Pacific Lumber Company was not willing to make that happen. Now, again, there are conflicting reports, but as historians, we do what we can with the primary sources <laughs> we have available. He drowned. Yes, he did. And not only did he end up losing, but the Pacific Lumber Company lost as well. Nobody in this case won. Painter lost his life. PL lost tons of money trying to maintain this nightmare of a railroad. Were you still able to walk that road? You can if you go into Scotia. It is, and if, you, if I go to the previous one here, this was a photo that was taken fairly recently, and you can actually hike out to this. You can, yeah. It's a bit overgrown, and you'll hike over many slides to get there, but you can. Very geologically active area, absolutely. There was passenger service that the Pacific Lumber Company offered. But you can see here in this picture, what trains would frequently have to do is go from Scotia to a point at which a slide had cascaded down and wiped out a trestle or two. And passengers would have to get out and hike over the top of that slide to an awaiting train on the other side. Now imagine doing this instead of driving, for example. This is your way of getting around, and this is normal. One particular newspaper account suggested that during one of these processes, a slide almost came down again on top of the folks that were trying to get to that awaiting train. So there's serious danger involved with this. It wasn't long before giant corporations started making their way and fixating on Humboldt County. They knew that whoever was going to be able to build a mainline railroad here first was going to make money, hand over fist. The problem was is that they would have to buy out a lot of the railroads in this area. What Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe ended up doing is they came up and they made a proposal to buy out all of these predecessor railroads and connect them into what was called the San Francisco and Northwestern Railroad. Now, this included the Pacific Lumber Company's railroad as well, knowing darn well that their route was geologically unstable. They still wanted it because they wanted that foothold here in the county, and they did not want competition. They wanted single monopoly over this area. When they bought this, trackage had only gone about as far south as a couple of miles south of Scotia. Santa Fe wanted to invest more. They wanted to start building more so they could potentially achieve bringing Humboldt County into the greater part of California as far as reaching here. 
which is why they decided that they would build as far south as Shively. If you take a look at the map here, Pacific Lumber Company got to about there. They were going to build additional mileage down to here. This included a number of very, very big projects. If you go into the, if you go up the street here, you will find the Eureka Rail Yard. Back when it was under Santa Fe's control as part of the San Francisco and Northwestern's route, they had a giant depot that had the Santa Fe emblem emblazoned on it. This is what it looked like. This building unfortunately burned in a fire. But it does give you an idea that the bigger corporations were playing hardball now, and they were here to stay. And where was, was this located exactly? Well, if you were to go there to the Eureka Rail Yard today, there is a little outbuilding that does not look like much, but this is actually what replaced this structure. And the foot of this building would have been right next door to this one. And that is, but where is it in today's time? I mean, where would it be? Where would the location be? Yeah. So if you were to the balloon track that's yeah. just up the road here, it would be within the balloon track area. One of the bigger trestles that this company had to tackle was one at Stitts Creek. Now you can see, clear cutting this area did the company no favors. Those trees were helping keep the, the geology stable. Now when you get rain, that whole hillside is gonna come down. This is what Stitts Creek looks like today. This trestle is significantly smaller in length, but it is the same height, and you can still get to it pretty darn easily. This one is at Stitts Creek. It's between Scotia and Shively. Very close to Eleanor. It's a, it's a place name I throw out that not very many people know, but it, it is very close to the community of Eleanor. The second project that they had to tackle was the second major tunnel within Humboldt County, one that would be bored through what's called Shively Bluff. Now, Shively Bluff has the same exact problems as the Pacific Lumber Company's route along the Scotia Bluffs. It's made out of sandstone, and this tunnel is particularly long, well over 1,000 feet. To answer the question as to whether or not anyone died here, one guy did, a man by the name of Charles Hellborn. Mr. Hellborn was tasked with administrating the use of dynamite within this, within this particular tunnel. Now, at some point, he was complaining of head pain. Now, if I had to guess, he probably got a cerebral hemorrhage. How? By being in a tunnel when there are explosives going off and absolutely racking your brain back and forth. Now, he's on the job, and he's pointing to everybody like, my head hurts, my head hurts. And finally, they tell him, you know what? Go get checked out. Take the quote-unquote ambulance service, the train, from Shively to Eureka, and go get yourself checked out. And that he did. Unfortunately for him, by the time that he made it up here, he wanted to check himself into a hotel, and he died shortly thereafter. Again, it doesn't describe in detail how he died, but if I had to guess, probably from making use of that dynamite. Is this a easy to access this tunnel? This one is not. Um, it's it's, very, it's very overgrown. This is my wife Maya here in this photo. <laughs> the way that I get to it is by going down to river level, below the bluff, and then scaling up to it. So it's definitely not a walk for the faint of heart. Very steep. Very steep. Uh -huh. very, very steep up. <laughs> if you walk into this tunnel, you will likely feel little bits of sand raining down on the top of your head. This is a photograph taken of my buddy Sean Mitchell, a fellow rail historian, who is inspecting a piece of what was once the roof liner. Fossilized seashells, again, in this. 
very brittle, not the kind of thing that you want to build a tunnel through. But it worked for all intents and purposes. Very close by. Is that the same tunnel? There, there is a tunnel across from Home Splot that we'll get to. Okay. Um, but if you were, I believe the closest community on the opposite bank of the river would be Pepperwood if you were to go to Avenue of the Giants and then cross the river. I don't know how many of you have ever wandered through a tunnel like this, but the first time that I went here with Sean, it was very dark. We did not have any flashlights. The only way that we were really able to tell what the heck was in front of us was by me taking my camera, which had a flash, taking a picture, and going, well, that's what's in front of us. We got pretty darn far in. We did not, at the time, walk the whole thing. But I dropped my glasses leaving, so I ended up coming back the second day with my good friend, Kaylin Walker. Hope you found me. I did. <laughs> and when we came back the second day, we decided to press on a little bit further. I knew that this tunnel was curved. What I didn't know is that there was extreme danger working around that corner. This tunnel has collapsed on the north end. And when I took this picture, I looked at Kaylin and I said, I think it's time to go. <laughs> one of the unique features of this tunnel is one that they installed for drainage purposes. You wouldn't think that standing water would be that big of an issue in a tunnel like this, but for a couple of them, it was. So what the engineers did was they built gutters on either side of the tracks. Water would flow into them, and then the water would flow out through the side of the bluff through a second but smaller drainage bore. Now this bore is about roughly five feet tall. The first time I visited here, I had no idea that this was going to be something we would see. Hearing the wind whistle when you're halfway through what you think is an enclosed area was not very cool. That was pretty spooky. And then even more spooky to find it without expecting. There were no further deaths building this tunnel, but there were two additional laborers who were hurt, again, using dynamite. So Santa Fe has effectively bought out many of the railroads that existed within the county. Santa Fe's big corporate competition was Southern Pacific. Southern Pacific's headquarters was in San Francisco. Naturally, Southern Pacific wanted to buy out all the railroads that were nearby San Francisco and work their way north, whereas Santa Fe had the idea to buy out all the northern railroads and push south. Both of them figured out pretty darn quickly, based on assessments and surveys, that it was going to be prohibitively expensive to build a connecting mainline railroad to Humboldt, which is why, in 1907, they decided to join forces to make this happen. Railroad completely financed by private enterprise. One of the other questions that I had in the past was, was the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco a motivational factor? And it definitely was, but we do have proof that this company was tentatively going to be formed prior to the earthquake and fire. When that earthquake occurred, it shook the city of San Francisco to its core. The catastrophic fire that broke out afterwards consumed most of the city. Here in Humboldt, we felt the earthquake as well. There was definite geological movement happening. Even in Arcata area, the tidal mud flats that I mentioned before actually sank that day. Southern Pacific had decided to make a survey of the middle fork of the Eel River prior to the earthquake, trying to figure out how are we going to close this gap between Willits and Eureka. Whereas Santa Fe 
had made a survey of the South Fork of the Eel River, which is what Highway 101 follows now. The question was, we have multiple surveys, which route are we going to use? What it really came down to was the maximum gradient. Again, trains do not like going uphill at a very steep curvature. They do not have the means to do so without specific help. The middle fork was chosen for that reason, and there must have been one heck of a compelling argument to make, because that middle fork of the Eel River is one of the most geologically active areas that I've ever seen. It would eventually become the costliest railroad to maintain in the entire continental United States. But the south fork of the Eel River was at least projected to be even more financially unfeasible, which is why they went with the middle fork. The actual company between these two entities officially became the Northwestern Pacific Railroad Company in 1907. Just to give you an example of what they were facing, this is a place that's known by former employees as Milepost 201. If you were to go down to Alder Point, and you were to go down about, oh, 20, not, not even 20 miles south, you would wind up here. That geological formation that you're looking at is about 600 feet wide and several thousand feet in length. Abbott Creek flows right down the middle of it. When the rain comes and that creek gets flowing, it feeds into what is called blue clay, or blue goo, as I've been told. When this stuff becomes saturated, it moves incessantly, just like the Scotia Bluffs, only this time in mass. That whole 600-foot-wide slide will move at once. During the 1906 earthquake, it shook so darn hard that that slide actually ended up damming the Eel River from end to end which has also happened in Scotia at the past, in the past. This is a photo taken of that area. Despite many attempts by engineers to try and figure out how to reroute water out of, out of Abbott Creek, they were unsuccessful. This was a constant maintenance headache for the entire duration of the railroad's opening. It has been described to me as a mud glacier. You can see the toe of the slide at the very bottom. This is far from alone in terms of other active, quote unquote, trouble spots that this railroad was going to have to regularly maintain. This is a photo taken very close to Bell Springs. You can see the tracks are right up there, and the ground under which they were once being held up by, is completely slipped out now, cascading into the river. One of the reasons that we regularly have to dredge our bay is because this river has the highest sediment yield as a result of active geology cascading into the river and carrying it to the mouth of Humboldt Bay and dumping it on the Humboldt Bar. It was projected that the cost of building this railroad was going to be significant. Middle Fork was decided, and work officially began in 1907. However, due to a variety of factors, including an economic depression at the time, work was discontinued for a couple of years. It was roughly going to cost about $120,000 in 1907 money per mile. You'll see a lot of these gifts that show uh, footage taken in 1914 upon the railroad's completion. This is one of the tunnels within the canyon. This is a photo taken of the inside of that tunnel that they were going to be building through Brian's Bluff. It was constructed between 1909 and 1910. To close that gap, they decided to have crews work from both ends, 
One crew working out of Shively, pushing south, the other crew pushing north of Willits. There were no known deaths building this tunnel, although there very well might be one in the future because some genius has gone into the tunnel since then, and you might notice that the giant redwood support beams are gone. Now, I have no doubt that they would sell for a pretty penny these days, but it has made walking this tunnel all the more dangerous. So to answer your question from earlier, if you were at Holmes Flat looking across the river, you would see what was Brian's Bluff. And there is a tunnel that's built through it. If you look really close, there is a small drainage bore, just like the one at Shively. It was able to take excess water that would have otherwise accumulated in the tunnel and flushed it out. This drainage bore is still accessible. It's about five feet tall. And since the railroad's closure, a goose has actually ended up making use of it as a home. Don't worry, the goose did come back after I had harassed it and <laughs> sent it flying down to the Eel River below. This is a picture taken of the south portal of the same tunnel. Bit of a before and after for you. This was when they were actually constructing it, and it's the same area, same portal. And then another photograph of the opposite end. I like this photo primarily because it shows what the Union Plank Walk and Wharf Company would have made use of. You notice that there are still rails on the ground, and these ones are made out of steel, but they're using horse-drawn power instead of locomotives to build this thing. Why? It's much cheaper, for one thing. The smaller width of rail that you have, the cheaper it is to build. And you can prepare an area to lay down heavier rail. Pushing up from the south side of things, uh, just north of Willits, at Outlet, you have Tunnel 11. Once they had made their way through Brian's Bluff, they had to construct a large steel bridge over Larrabee Creek, which is still standing to this day. A whole lot of the bridges that we had for this railroad were lost in the 1964 flood. This one actually survived, and you can still go to it. You can see in the background around the old footage that they absolutely clear-cut everything, all the old growth that used to be in Larrabee. Devastated. The north side had the advantage of having a railroad that would lead right to the point at which they were working. So they had locomotives, in this case a locomotive from the Virginia and Truckee Railroad that was used to haul major supplies to and from this area, including things like steam shovels that made the work that much faster. Excuse me, where is Larrabee? Larrabee is, let's see, I'm trying to think of the closest place name. It would be about 15, 10, 10 miles or so south of Scotia. Mm -hmm. If nothing is left of it. I'm sorry, one more time. Is anything left of it? Of uh, the Larrabee and the railroad yeah. through it? Oh yeah, the tracks are still in place and the bridge is definitely still there and you can get to it very easily. Yes, if, if you look at the map, it should say Larrabee on there as well. Yes, if, if you were to go to Shively and then follow the old gravel road to it, you could get to it. And there is a summer bridge as well that takes you from Holmes Flat to Larrabee. Even though they were working from both ends, in order to speed up the process of production, they decided to send work crews deeper into the canyon, places where there was absolutely no infrastructure. This is what daily life looked like for the crews that were contracted out to build this route. You can see that they made use of tents. I don't know this with certainty, but I believe that there were 25 camps that littered the canyon between uh, Long Vale, which is on your map, and Shively for the process of building this. 
There was another death that occurred very close to Larrabee, and I'll read a description. Having placed several hundred pounds of powder in a hole, his calculations proved to be faulty, and tons of rock and gravel came crashing down. After hours of later, his body was found to be crushed almost into a pulp. So not only do you have the issue of building through bluffs, but you also have large rocks that are going to be in your way, ones that need to be blown up. Again, working with dynamite at this time is very precarious stuff. Moving further south, you would get to what is known as the South Fork Bridge. Now, South Fork is very close to the old ghost town of Dyerville, right next to Avenue of the Giants. When you're driving down Highway 101 south of here, and you look out on the, the South Fork of the Eel River, you will see this bridge. It is a four-span bridge, half of which was wiped out in the 1964 flood. But the south half survived it. As time went on, crews continued to push further south. Year is now 1911. This is footage taken of Tunnel 37 located at McCann. This is what the same tunnel looks like today. You'll notice that the portals changed over time. They had redwood timbers lining the outside, and as more uh, capital became available, they had more, perfect, uh, more uh, expensive portals created to ensure that this would last longer. following tunnel moving further south, Tunnel 36 in Whitlow, both tunnels being considerably short in comparison to some of the larger projects. Tunnel 35 at, Blue, at Zook's Bluff, moving, moving further south again. And of course, Tunnel 34 at Eel Rock, the one that I grew up going to in the summer. On the south side, once they had built Tunnel 11, of course they moved further north to Tunnel 12. And then in 13 at Longvale, following Outlet Creek. Tunnel 14, 15, all within the neighborhood of each other. And then finally, they were able to break ground on the south side, moving into the middle fork of the Eel River at a spot known as Dos Rios. This is the point at which I've been told by former employees that this railroad is garbage because the earth moves that much. No way better to delay a train than to have a big landslide or a slip out, a washout in your way. One of the other types of deaths that occurred while during the construction phase of the railroad was the actual lumber camps that were built to cut down trees and then turn them into the timbers that would eventually line the tunnels. An unknown man was killed on the job at one of those local mills in 1911. Another man was killed very close to Larrabee working with explosives in 1911. And another was killed by a falling tree very close to McCann the same year. One of the more photographed accidents that occurred during 1911 was just outside Tunnel 38 at Brian's Bluff. That same locomotive that I showed in the picture earlier, the ex-Virginia and Truckee one, was hauling a train crew, and a big old slide came down right on top of the train, swept most of the train into the Eel River below, and then also swept five individuals under with all that debris that came down. All of them survived, fortunately, but they suffered severe injur injuries. The question becomes, if you want to have camps 
in the further reaches of the canyon where there are no roads yet, how do you get supplies from point A to point B? The answer is you hire these guys, called Klippel and McLean, who decided the best way to do this was to build a couple of boats. One was called the Poison Oak, and the other one was called the Poison Ivy. Now, the Poison Oak was powered by a small gasoline engine. Its job, transport people, goods, and dynamite from point A to point B, usually in the neighborhood of Shively to places such as Eel Rock. The Poison Ivy, on the other hand, was a bit more crude. It was just a large skid steer boat that had a, a steam donkey on it. What they would do is they would have one guy who would go way out beyond where the boat was. They would tie off around a tree and then put that chain and attach it to the donkey and it would yard it up river. Any idea if the poison oak was a stone wheeler or a side wheeler? Uh, I believe it was a paddle uh, wheeler, if I remember correctly. There, side, side wheeler or stone wheeler? There is a photograph of it in Linford Bud Scott's book, Looking Back 100 Years, and, I, and I'll have to include that the next time. Yes. Here is a photo of the poison oak, long abandoned after the construction process. It's the only photograph that I've ever seen of it. If any of you have seen more, I would love to see it. This is one of my favorite pictures to come out of this particular time period. This is a photograph of the poison ivy. Now you can see that it was just a very crude craft. But what it's carrying is particularly interesting. They brought what are called dinky locomotives, which are very small. They are not standard gauge in terms of the rail that they are running on. They're built smaller. And they actually loaded both of these very heavy locomotives onto a boat that would have gone up the middle fork of the Eel River, likely to Eel Rock and then pushing further south to Fort Seward. To give you an idea of just how big those locomotives are, there it is at work in the neighborhood of Fort Seward. And for perspective, there's a gentleman standing there in the front. Pretty darn crazy, in my opinion, to do that. Jumping back to the south side of things, they had the same idea. They wanted to put camps throughout. They wanted to get folks to a very remote location within the middle fork of the Eel River Canyon called Island Mountain. Now, the only way they were going to be able to do that was to build wagon roads. Instead of using boats like they were on the north end, they were going to have to go over massive summits. They built a base of operation in Ukiah, and as the operation moved further north, it moved to Sherwood. This is a guy named John Schneider. Now, now Schneider was written about, he, he was interviewed several times, and he talked about his experience of hauling supplies to and from Island Mountain. And he wrote in regard to the roads that he was traveling along while he's carrying dynamite in the back of his wagon, this road was mountainous, narrow, and full of rocks and chuck holes. I told one of my pals I was scared to haul powder. Another teamster said when he was working for this same company in Utah, a load had blown up and all that was ever found of the driver was parts of his shoes. So serious risks here. Winter of 1911 brought serious issues. The wagon road that they initially built had to go over massive summits over Bell Springs. With snow on the summit, they could not work, which is why they ended up building a second wagon road that paralleled what would become the railroad's right-of-way north of Longvale. Now, Schneider hauled for this company for a long time. He did not work on any of the tunnels, but he met all the crew members that were there. This is likely somewhat similar to what he would have been hauling. This is a photograph taken in Island Mountain when they were preparing the timbers. 
They, literally, they did not have them shipped in. They made use of what they had, and they built these on the spot to line the inside of what would eventually become a mile-long tunnel at Island Mountain. Moving back to the north end, in 1912, Filkins Tunnel was addressed, which would otherwise be Tunnel 33, moving south. Back on the south side, you had another tunnel, Tunnel 17, located at Deer Lodge. Tunnel 18, again, moving from the south at Woodman Creek. And then from the north, Tunnel 30. Another individual had his life taken during this construction process here near Fort Seward. You can see in the lower right there, this was one of the camps that existed within the canyon. It must have been beautiful when there wasn't so much risk of being at work. A teamster was injured on the job near Fort Seward in 1912. His legs were crushed as the result of a runaway tram. Tunnel 31 near Fort Seward. Okay, thank you. Tunnel 20 near Nashmead, moving again further north from the south. Tunnel 21, 22 at Spy Rock, 23 very close to the neighborhood of Spy Rock, the smallest of the tunnels built through that outcrop that you can see there on the left, 24 at Bell Springs, and the big one, Tunnel 27 at Island Mountain the one that would be over a mile long. And on its south side, there was need for the second of three major bridges that was going to be built Are for the railroad. That far now? Okay. The trains haven't run around here since February 1998, uh, but they absolutely did run there right up until closure. In fact, the last train that ever left Eureka is still sitting there at Island Mountain. They had to drop the load because they were in the middle of a storm. And all the cars that they left there are still sitting in this very isolated place within the Middle Fork. Give you a bit of background on the Island Mountain Tunnel. It's a little over 4,000 feet. It took three years to build. Success was measured in gaining about one to two feet a day building this. On the opposite bank of the Eel River, in this photograph you can see the tunnel portal there dead center, there was a mining company who was making use. There used to be a very large bridge on very close to the north end of this tunnel. 75,000 caps and 300,000 fuses were required just to build this one tunnel. Now that same individual, John Schneider, who used to haul dynamite, he recounted in his memoirs that when he went and hauled dynamite to this area, that he talked with folks who claimed that there was a massive accident that occurred here, building this tunnel. The story goes that 17 men were at work in the tunnel. They had put dynamite in, and they were waiting for the blast to go off, but the blast never came. They thought that something was wrong, and so they all wandered back into the tunnel, and then it went off in their face. Supposedly, it killed all 17 of them. I have researched this to no end. I have never found another person who wrote in the newspapers, in a personal memoir, mentioning this disaster. But if it is true, then it would be one of the worst construction accidents to happen in Northern California, especially for this time. A photo of the south portal of the Island Mountain Tunnel. A 
a better picture to give you an idea of where that mining company was located. They had the bridge leading up to where the tunnel was being actively worked on. There were several injuries during this process that were for sure noted in the newspaper, but never that account that John provided as far as 17 being killed. This is what Iowan Mountain looked like when it was completed. Large crossing over the Eel River, straight into a mile-long tunnel. More footage of the construction process. Steam shovels on the left. Probably near Fort Seward. There were three major bridges that were built over the Eel River. The first one being at Iowan Mountain, the second one being at Cane Rock, just south of Alder Point, and the third one being at South Fork, which is near. Did that survive the 64 flood? In all three cases, all of them were wiped out. The only one that even came close to surviving was the one at South Fork, which is why when you're driving down 101, half of the bridge is white and the other half is really rusted out. The bridge at Island Mountain, this one in particular, I interviewed a guy who was there during the flood in 1964. He watched this bridge float because they had redecked it recently and there were 55 gallon drums on each side. The river was so darn high, it was just about there, not quite to the tunnel level, but it was high enough that this bridge broke away and because of those drums on the other side, it actually floated. A guy in Alder Point actually made the remark that he saw the bridge floating down the river, and he knew it was the Island Mountain Bridge because he had carved his name into the side of it, and he could see it floating down underneath the bridge he was standing on. One of the other construction employees was killed in 1913, very close to Deer Lodge. He ended up drowning, so not a direct result of construction, but he was still employed at the time for building the railroad. Another fellow was killed when a blast occurred at Fort Seward. He was struck in the head. His head was reportedly peppered with rock and his body was largely crushed into a pulp. This photograph has an interesting story. One of the gentlemen who is on this was part of the work crew for this steam shovel. Now, during the working process, at some point, a slide came down on top of the steam shovel. He ended up losing his arm because of it. This is a postcard, and on the back of the postcard, what I did not expect to find was the guy that lost his limb actually wrote out on the back of this, this is me. This is a photograph of me building the railroad, and here's my story. So this is one of the more amazing stories that has come out of it, and I've confirmed it by finding an accompanying newspaper that describes how Frank O'Neill was injured during this time. Another individual near Alder Point was uh, killed as well when rock was loosened by a blast in 1913. As we move closer and closer to 1914 when the railroad officially opened, it was becoming huge news in the area. The Humboldt Times released a particularly special uh, newspaper that featured the railroad and what the area could potentially look like once commerce and industry was established, for better or worse. Advertisements such as this. They were expecting to open the railroad by 1913, but there was a major natural disaster that occurred that year. One of the issues that they had with building this route it was built below the high water mark for the river. When 1913 rolled around, they found out just how bad it could get when 
the floodwaters rose up and literally ripped away all the work that they had been working on in several places. Here's an example taken in the wake of the flood. You can see that the water got so high it sheared off the side of that canyon. Something that's particularly interesting to me is that the companies knew this. They had definitive proof now that the railroad was built below the high water mark and they still didn't care. Why? They wanted access to that timber, even if it was going to be prohibitively expensive. More aftermath photos from the flood of 1913. This is a photograph of when uh, construction was taking place at Cane Rock, just south of Alder Point. This is the second of those three major bridges which span the Eel River. If you were a surveyor photographing this, something you would have noted is that there is silt atop the piers of the bridge that's supposed to be installed within the coming months. You think that there might be a flood like that again in the near future? And there certainly was. They had spent a long time preparing the bridge at Island Mountain, just outside Tunnel 27, which was ravaged by the floodwaters, and one of the major supports fell. Millions of dollars lost. Another photo at Spy Rock. For time's sake, we'll skip ahead a little bit. The year is 1914 now. They are behind schedule, but they still want to build this thing. They're wrapping up now with the construction of the final tunnels that are more or less dead center between Eureka and Willits. Tunnel 28 at Kekawaka and Tunnel 29. And finally, Tunnel 30 at Alder Point. Oh, and 31 at Fort Seward. Another individual, Peter Clark, was killed the same year, struck by a rock from blasting dynamite. This is one of the larger slides that's very close to Dos Rios. It was reported in the newspaper that a slide very similar to this one came down. For reference sake, the arrow is pointing at a boulder that is just about the size of a minivan. So this is stuff that they would have to combat for over 100 years, well, darn near 100 years. Another individual was killed near Woodman Creek, 1914. Another man who was working on the bridge at Cane Rock fell to his death. And another very close to Brock Creek, it may have been Mud Creek, also lost his life and sustained, and another sustained major injuries. I'm not sure how many of you have been to Fort Seward. But back then, it was advertised as a coming metropolis. They envisioned that we, there would be this massive city within Southern Humboldt as a direct result of building the railroad. It was featured in this 1914 newspaper that advertised all of the pluses that would come with having a major community established in Fort Seward, including dairying, excellent hunting and fishing grounds, etc. And of course, timber industry. The Fort Seward Depot, the thing, the, the, the structure that I walked around in as a kid was built in 1914. Brand new. The first train would not actually make it all the way from 
uh, Willits area to Eureka until October 1914. But the first passenger train to make use of going into the canyon to give people an idea of where they would be going in the future occurred earlier in the year, in May 1914. This is a photograph of that southbound train heading over what is Fort Seward Creek. One of the major structures that we've unfortunately lost in the Fort Seward area is that of the hotel. It was built using river rock from the eel, and unfortunately it burned in a fire a number of decades later. But you can see that they were building that massive hotel in anticipation of all the people that would be now coming to an area that was hardly frequented anymore. This is a, a footage of the tunnel and bridge that was built at Island Mountain. They had just gotten done wrapping it up. More footage from Cane Rock upon its completion as well. When the time finally came for that first train, individuals in San Francisco who were leaving to venture into Eureka were given this pamphlet outlining what would be a major event for Humboldt County. One of the promotional pieces that they passed out to people that were riding that first train. People were very ecstatic about the fact that they were finally going to be able to go in and out of this area with ease. In order to get to Sausalito, passengers were loaded onto ferries that were also owned by the Northwestern Pacific Railroad Company. You would have been ferried from San Francisco to the opposite side of the bay in Sausalito, where, then you, where you would then board an awaiting train. That train would then take you all the way up past Willits into the Eel River Canyon, and this is footage of that very first train near Cane Rock. At this location, the train stopped because they were going to be driving the final spike into the ground, this one right here. It was a major hallmark moment, one that represented the fact that we finally had a lifeline between the greater world and here. A before and after for you of that event, passengers actually got off the train and witnessed uh, the president of Southern Pacific driving that golden spike into the ground. Now, they did not leave it there, so I hope that there's nobody inclined to go out treasure hunting for it. I think it's particularly fitting that the same location that all of these people were congregated at to celebrate the opening of the railroad and the driving of the Golden Spike at Cane Rock is now completely uh, slid over by a landslide. Now that when I saw this photo, I thought it was particularly interesting because it is F Street just right up the road from here at night on the day that the train was supposed to be here. But there's no people. It's completely dark out. Why did this guy take this picture? And the reason is the darn train that was supposed to be here by night was completely delayed by, you guessed it, a landslide. People were here in, a t in anticipation here in Eureka, waiting for them to show up, had decked all of Old Town to the nines in celebration of this, and nobody showed up. Probably looked something very similar to this because that slide came down at Sonoma Creek very close to Whitlow. But they were still able to clear that slide fast enough that the train finally did arrive in Eureka at 2.30 in the morning, long after everyone had gone to bed. But if you go to the Blue Lake Museum, they actually have this flag in their collection. And you can see inscribed on it, the first train to arrive 
2.30 a.m., October 1914. The train was decked for the nines just like Old Town was, and this was it, rolling through town the following day. So what do we know now, now that the railroad has been officially been open? What are the hard numbers of building this route? We know that at least 19 lives were lost, if not more. If that story by Schneider is true, then significantly more died, and many more were injured as a result. The final cost of building this route was $14 million, which back then was, in today's money, it would be extreme. This mainline railroad led to the establishment of tons and tons of mills in our area, all of which made use of the old growth timber to ship it down to San Francisco and then abroad to the greater world. List of my primary sources as I go through these, if anyone has any particular questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. But that is the story of how our railroad was built and the lives that it cost building it. Yes. I have. Um, Yes. Um, the only tunnels that I have yet to actually walk through are the tunnels between Island Mountain and Woodman Creek. So th I believe that there are four in that neighborhood that I haven't personally walked through, but hoping to probably this summer. Um, even if they're collapsed, I'm uh, harebrained enough to wander in and see if I can get some pictures for all of you. It's something that I love to do. All the primary sources, all that good stuff. Any other questions for me? Yes, it is. Yes, the the Eureka Slough Bridge it is a replacement of a much older bridge, and the idea was is that back then we were still making use of the sloughs for traffic. Now, it didn't happen super often, and as you said, it was used very minimally, but they still wanted that capability to raise that bridge up and allow for uh, traffic to come through. Uh, I don't think it would work today, but we do still do rides on it. If you are familiar with the Timber Heritage Association that is located out in Samoa, we do rides over that bridge pretty frequently. In fact, if you look at the schedule that's on the front desk on the way out, you can find out when we will be running on that bridge so you can actually ride the rails yourself and take in the sights. But yes. So if we had more time, I would gladly give you what the history was beyond 1914 to 1998, but it's best described as a cooperation between Santa Fe and Southern Pacific until Southern Pacific bought out Santa Fe's share. Southern Pacific retained ownership of the Eureka to Willits portion until 1983. There were a number of disasters that basically forced their hand and they wanted to uh, sell off what was otherwise a burden on their economic feasibility. Um, they, le they ended up leasing it to a guy named Brian Whipple who reopened it as the Eureka Southern Railroad between Willits and Eureka. And north of Eureka, north end, who owns all, who owns Eureka? Once it transitioned from Eureka Southern, it was bought by the state, an agency called the North Coast Railroad Authority. The North Coast Railroad Authority has just been phased out and replaced by the Great Redwood Trail Agency, as the state is hoping to make use of the right of way to establish a world-class walking trail between Cloverdale and Eureka. Okay, so, yeah. Yes. So technically, the property is not abandoned. Every, everything that you saw today, it is still owned. But 
it hasn't been put to use for well over 20 years now. That very well may change within the coming years, but there are a number of groups who are kind of competing to see the use of this. I know the skunk train is hoping to make use of the trackage up to Longvale, just south of Dos Rios. Um, and the Great Redwood Trail Agency is hoping to make use of the whole corridor. If it were up to me, I would love to see an excursion train from Timber Heritage Association from Samoa to Eureka right alongside that trail that Senator McGuire has envisioned. Both, best of both worlds and develop economic tourism and industry for the area. There was also a guy over here recently that was uh, trying to start a company with human power biking on the trail. Yes. For some reason, he was, they were shutting it down. Yes, and I, I'd be happy to talk with you more about that after. Anybody else have any questions for me? I'm just glad it's still old and intact from somebody. Yes. And, 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 and it's still technically state property. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. It's been a pleasure to give this presentation to you. I will be doing future ones that detail the history from 1914 on, in addition to possibly even more presentations on the other many local lumber railroads that we had. This was far from the one and only, but it was the main line in our area. Thank you. Thank you.